So quick poll, how many of you watched the Academy Awards a couple of Sundays ago? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I think it was like one person raised their hand in here. That, that's kind of interesting, you know, because uh, I, I didn't see any of the movies, you know. The last movie I went to see in the theater was Napoleon, and as a historian, no. <laughs> no. I mean, I didn't watch the Oscars. I didn't see any of the movies. I, I, I do find it an interesting phenomenon, though. It's kind of like the Super Bowl for the entertainment world. And they have this massive pregame show, you know, that works up to the thing with the red carpet. You know, the red carpet where the reporters are all gathered there and they're snapping pictures and they ask the celebrities dumb questions and they get even dumber answers. The red carpet is the event before the event. And that's what the event is really all about. It's about being seen and seeing. It's about the three G's of Hollywood, glitter, glamour, and gossip. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a red carpet or seen anything like that. The closest I ever got to that was when uh, I was serving as pastor in Park City, Utah, which is the home of the Sundance Film Festival. And every January for 10 days, the celebrities of the entertainment world would descend upon Park City and you'd see all kinds of black SUVs and limousines going up and down the road into town. It was a great week to go skiing because these people filled all the hotels and uh, they didn't ski. So it was great if you were a local, you could get out on the slopes and basically have them to yourself. We called it the invasion of the PIBs the people in black, because they all wore black. And I had friends who would call and say, you know, did you see any celebrities uh, during Sundance? Well, not exactly, you know, because I didn't go to the expensive restaurants in town. I went to Subway. (laughs) And interestingly, I bumped into Kevin Sorbo at Subway. Hercules. Anyone? Anyone? Those are the kind of celebrities I bump into. Merlin Olson, I ran into Merlin Olson. Some of you are old enough to remember Merlin Olson, Little House in the Prairie, used to be a commentator for NBC Sports. Yeah, I saw him eating fried chicken one day by himself in a restaurant. That's about it. That's it. Not too many celebrities there for me to see. We do like to rub shoulders though. You know, if we encounter somebody famous. We always feel like we get a little bit of their glory kind of, kind of manifested onto us. We love glitter, glamour, and gossip. We just can't get enough of that. But this is not anything new. This was true in the ancient world as well. And we might think of Palm Sunday as kind of like the, the red carpet show, the pre-show for Holy Week. A superstar is coming to town. So the people of Jerusalem spread their cloaks on the road. The crowds wave branches of palm trees. This is the equivalent of, in the ancient world, of showing paparazzi, taking pictures, doing all that kind of stuff. Because this major event is underway. It's Passover week. And some scholars estimate that Jerusalem, a town of perhaps 40,000, would swell to almost a quarter of a million people during the time of the Passover festival. You could say without too much exaggeration that the city was electrified with Oscar night kind of enthusiasm. And Jesus is aware of this. In fact, he knew exactly what he was getting into. He expected a hero's welcome on Palm Sunday, but he also knew how all of this was going to turn out. He had been alluding to it for weeks. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, telling his disciples that he was going to be arrested and crucified. What they say about Hollywood was probably true in Jerusalem as well. It's a tough place. I heard one actor say once that people in Hollywood are always touching you, not because they like you, but because they want to see how soft you are before they eat you alive. (laughs) That's a tough town. Matthew also tells us that Jesus and his disciples did all their own advance work. He sends two disciples ahead of them to, to, ahead of him to re- acquire a colt and said to them, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. It's almost like a secret code. The point of Palm Sunday is that the celebrity Christ is going to be given the celebrity treatment as he enters Jerusalem. 
and all the expected elements are there in place. He makes a royal entrance and a procession associated with powerful kings and conquering generals. Some scholars speculate that as Jesus is riding down the Palm Sunday road into Jerusalem from the east, that perhaps Pontius Pilate had another parade going on in the west, coming in from Caesarea to be there for the festival. The contrast between Pilate, a Roman, what riding a horse versus Jesus riding on a donkey couldn't be more clear. He comes into Jerusalem, but as he does so, he's acting out a familiar script. He's escorted by the citizens of Jerusalem, waving those palm branches. They praise him for the deeds of power they've seen or heard about, the healings and miracles. They sing hymns of acclamation. They cry out, Hosanna, which is a word that kind of contains elements of both praise and hope. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. They might have recalled another parade like this about 200 years before that they had heard about. Judah Maccabee riding into Jerusalem in the same way. Here was another messianic kind of figure who had kicked out a foreign invader back in the 160s B.C., No doubt the crowd was expecting a similar result from this would-be Messiah. Finally, someone's coming to rid us of these Romans and restore us to being the people of God again. So Jesus rides on a colt, just as King Solomon did before his coronation, a sign of humility. Although Jesus' choice of a young animal could also mean that he's a bringer of peace. More likely, he's intentionally calling to mind a prophecy from Zechariah 9, which Matthew alludes to in his version of this, of the king coming to Jerusalem on the colt of a foal of a donkey. Jesus is acting out the script, acting out this parable from the Old Testament. People would have understood it. And they grabbed onto that image. Jesus is a superstar. He's got the three G's going for him there. There's glitter, glamour, and gossip. There's the glitter of the royal entrance. There's the glamour of the waving palm branches and even the gossip associated with his disciples and this borrowed cult. There's a lot of buzz about this superstar as he enters the holy city to pick up his prize. But as we gather here on Holy Week, the beginning, we know some things that the crowd did not. This was the king, and he was going to receive a crown, but it would be a crown of thorns. He does get lifted up, but it's on a form of execution. He will be immortalized not in a statue, but on a cross. Like modern celebrities, Jesus is not only idolized, He's also picked apart. He's feeling the love on Sunday. He's feeling the disappointment on Monday. And by Friday, many of these same people shouting Hosanna now are shouting for him to be crucified. The real straw that breaks the camel's back is the incident in the temple that begins at verse 12. If you're continuing to read there in Matthew, Jesus is going to go into the temple and turn over the tables of the money changers. What we have to understand here, though, is that this isn't simply Jesus throwing a hissy fit about people selling stuff in church. In verse 17, Jesus says that they have turned the temple into a den of robbers. But here's where the Greek is instructive. The word for robbers here actually means something more like brigands or revolutionaries. In other words, rather than simply chastising these nefarious businessmen, Jesus is acting out a parable of judgment on the temple. Instead of a house of worship, the temple had become the center of the people's nationalistic ambitions. They wanted to reestablish themselves as a national power with the temple as the symbol of that power. Think of the temple kind of like the Washington Monument and the White House and the Capitol and the Lincoln Memorial all kind of rolled together into one. That's how important it was for people in that culture. They wanted to be God's people a prominent nation on their own. And so Jesus' actions that day are actually kind of subversive. 
His actions were saying that God had judged the temple, that the religious establishment, that God had judged Israel's nationalistic ambition and that the temple was going to be destroyed. And it would be a few decades later by the Romans after a war, a rebellion that Jesus was warning them about. So the bottom line is Jesus rides triumphantly into Jerusalem, but rather than take the crown and the seat of power, he goes to the temple, to the heart of people's expectations, and he trashes it. This was a different kind of king. And from this point on, the chatter about Jesus among the crowd becomes increasingly negative. People sense that he's not interested in driving out these oppressive Romans. They notice that he travels with a band of unarmed disciples, not a cell of terrorist operatives, as did Barabbas, for example, who we're going to talk about on Friday night. They hear him speak of coming wars and persecutions, not of glorious victories and times of prosperity. I mean, if you were running for president of Israel at this time, this was not the kind of stuff you would be doing. The chief priests and scribes and leaders of the people start to then to look for a way to get rid of Jesus, to bump him off. And by the end of the week, so does the crowd. Crucify him. Crucify him. See, Jesus is killed on Friday because he fails to live up to human expectations. What are expectations? They're often premeditated resentments. He's not the superstar they expected. He's a stranger, a disappointment, a one-hit wonder. And so they turn on him. And we'll see how that plays out as we journey through the rest of Holy Week. We can relate, if we're honest. I mean, we live in a culture with a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately sort of ethos. We expect that we should get some kind of pass from the culture because we're nice people. But this is not what Jesus of the Gospels is simply calling us to be. He's calling us to follow him, to embrace our own cross as he did his. See, the message of the palm branches and the red carpet is that Jesus Christ is Lord, not merely a la-la land celebrity. The crowds didn't get that, but we still can. On this Palm Sunday, as we begin the long road of Holy Week, we have to let Jesus step off the red carpet and simply be himself because Jesus is not interested in glitter, glamour, and gossip, but rather he's interested in three other Gs, in grace, in giving, and in goodness. We are saved by grace. It's Jesus' mission that makes it possible for us to live in a state of grace. We are children of grace, but for that grace, only God knows where we would be. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that we are saved by grace through faith in the crucified Christ, not the celebrity. Not by mighty warriors, not by preening politicians, not by smiling celebrities. We're saved by a savior who walks past the adoration of the crowd and also endures their jeers and taunts to do what he came to do. The crowd, whether they were for him or against him, didn't matter. He was going to do it for them anyway. He was going to do it for us. It was all about giving. He gave of himself. He who was rich became poor that we might be rich in grace. He said that he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. On the cross on Friday, he would give until there was no more to give. And it was about goodness the essential goodness of Jesus, unparalleled by anyone before him or after him, testifies to the kind of life to which we are called. 
You know, when you read through the Gospels, you see there are crowds around Jesus all the time. They're following him around, watching him do these miracles, hearing him teach, but you notice that they never really understand him. But he understood them. Jesus, when he looked at the crowd, did not see an adoring fan base. Instead, he saw people who were like sheep without a shepherd. And he was moved with compassion, a word that literally means to, from, from, the, from the gut to feel that deep desire and love. Wanting them to have so much more than they were looking for. He wasn't looking for their adoration. He was looking for their transformation. In Luke's version of the story, Jesus rides down that Palm Sunday road, not waving to the crowd with with big smile, but rather he's weeping. Weeping the tears of a prophet who knows what is coming, and he warns the people to recognize the time of their visitation from God. That's all coming. Palm Sunday is supposed to be a joyous day. We lay down a carpet of palm branches instead of a red carpet, but we know where this is going. Things are going to turn red by the end of the week. The last parade is the parade to Golgotha, and that's where he calls us to follow. As I said a couple of weeks ago, the cross isn't merely the means by which we receive eternal salvation, it's the way we are to live. His grace, his giving, his goodness compels us to change our behavior, not just to pat him on the back or to complain behind his back, but to be truly his. In fact, I want to argue that the return of the king truly invites us to lay down our palms in adoration and submission. Now, we gave out some palm branches this morning. We had to order those special They don't grow native. (laughs) We brought them in. You waved them this morning. The children waved them for them. But you know, I think palm has a completely different meaning for us these days. Some of you remember back in the 90s, the days before cell phones, when the Palm Pilot came out? Anybody? A few of you tech nerds out there, you're tapping away on your Palm Pilot. I had one too, and it never did exactly what I wanted it to do, but I always had it with me and was always whipping that out. And then suddenly we all have something else in our Palm. Today our Palms carry in them our most valuable information. As many people will say, my life is in my phone. Don't believe that? Look at someone who can't locate their phone. (laughs) We've put our lives in our palms. Our time, our finances, our hopes, our dreams, all of it can be entered into an electronic device. See, when we look closely at our palms, we know where our priorities lie. And Jesus calls us to lay down our palms. To put all the aspects of our lives at his feet. At the feet of the king. To examine closely where we put our time, where we spend our money, where we give our focus. On the three G's of Hollywood? No, on the three G's of grace and giving and goodness that characterizes a follower of Christ. See, the crowd's always just going to be spectators. They watch, they evaluate, they criticize. If you're always playing to the crowd, well, you're never going to make them happy. Not for long. But we still love a crowd. I mean, we love a crowd here at church. You know, next Sunday, we're preparing for a big crowd, lots of people coming here. It's always great on Easter Sunday. It makes you feel really good. It's full, just like it is on Christmas, because a lot of people 
Are H2O followers of Jesus? Holidays too only? But crowds are deceiving. We love to see big numbers. We love to hear the buzz. We love the excitement. I'm I'm, I'm all for it. But did you know that typically the Sunday after Easter is the lowest attendance Sunday of the year? I'm not saying that to guilt you to come back the following Sunday, but (laughs) I'm just saying. Crowds are fickle. They're easily dazzled, easily distracted, easily disinterested. But friends, Jesus isn't looking for a fan club. He's looking for disciples. He's looking for people who will follow him on the road to the cross. And that group is always going to be smaller in number. Notice that as the week goes on, more and more people will leave Jesus. Even his closest friends will desert him until he is left alone on the cross. And that's because Jesus will always be a stranger to a crowd who's looking for a celebrity Christ and celebrity followers. If you really want to know him, you've got to walk the blood-stained way of grace, of self-giving, of goodness. You've got to walk the way of the cross. I hope you won't miss that this week. We're going to gather Thursday night for Holy Thursday. We'll gather in the sanctuary and we'll share around the table as Jesus did with his disciples to give them that sign that we practice every Sunday but a sign that reminds us of the cost of following him. And then Friday night at seven o'clock we're gonna gather for Good Friday. Why is it good? It's because Jesus accomplishes his mission. We'll gather that night for a service of tenebrae, of light and darkness as we tell the story again of that day that Jesus gave himself up for us. And then we'll come back here Sunday morning, same time, same channel. And we'll gather to celebrate. But that celebration will mean so much more if we know what comes before. So don't miss it. Don't miss the opportunity to come out of the crowd and follow the crucified Christ.